Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Welcome, friend. Imagine being lost at sea, shipwrecked in unforgiving waters, with only a broken surfboard and a small water cooler to keep you afloat. Our guest today is here to share his harrowing account of that very thing. Johnny Savage's book, Lost in Stream, details his fight for survival after a sudden storm left he and his crew of the Aninga adrift with no hope in sight. Johnny, it's such an honor to have you here today. You have a powerful story, and I just want to thank you for making time for Inside Voice. Brenda, thank you so much for having me. Well, I am excited to tell your story, and so I would love to just start with that. Uh, could you just take us back to that day and then what took place on that very challenging day for you? Well, that time of year, I was working on what's called a private boat, um, which basically it's the owner and his family that are going fishing. It was a 56-foot Jim Smith, um, beautiful boat, well-built boat, and uh, we were staged in Key West, Florida. It was April 13, 1998. Um, preparing to make our crossing to go to Cancun, Mexico. Um, it's roughly a 350-mile trip. It's it's a straight shot that we make. Um, basically, we're heading into the Gulf Stream the whole way into the current, and we have to factor in an extra you know 20 miles or whatever it is, whatever speed the current's going that day, based on the amount of time that it's going to take us to go across. Um, we were very fortunate. We were one of the few boats that could actually make that crossing within a day um, in that time frame. Um, and I had uh, made plans with another boat in Palm Beach um, before we got to Key West to stage, and um, that boat happened to leave with another group of boats, and uh, so we were, we were making the crossing by ourselves, which, you know, it, that happens a lot. You know, we do have safety gear on the boats and so forth. So, um, one of the conversations we had that morning is should we take our e-perbit life raft and put it in the cockpit, um, which is basically the back of the boat um, deck. And um, it was, well, if we take it out, that means we're just going to have to clean it when we get there. Nothing mm -hmm. ever happened during the daytime. Wow. So it was just an unusual storm that arose that was unexpected, or what happened? In that time frame, the weather service isn't quite like it is today. Um, today, when I'm running a vessel, I have so much information that my fingertips, yeah. satellite overlays, and I can take my radar and overlay it on the satellite, stack them on mm -hmm. top of each other, and click on a little button. I can see exactly what the weather is anywhere in the ocean. Then it wasn't yeah. like that. Um, my Captain Eric, he uh, got what's called weather routers, which was basically a, a high seas weather report and mm -hmm. um, it showed good weather for our crossing. And initially it was beautiful weather. We had, it was maybe 12 knots, um, 10 to 12 knots, very calm. Um, we had a wonderful two to three foot rolling uh, followed sea, which Jim Smith's the type of boat is very well known for being a great followed sea. But so everything was perfect the way that, uh, that we wanted it to be for the making the crossing. We were about 90 miles out and um, we heard just a little bam, bam noise. We didn't know what that was. So Captain and I were both on the bridge. He pulled it out, you know, to, down to, to an idol. And I went downstairs to see what it was and where you would walk inside the boat to like, we call it the salon, but it's kind of like a living room. And yeah. um, there's a pair of doors that are there that are were on a pulley system. So that um, um, they open, like it has a boat rocks. It was kind of like they would counterbalance each other so they wouldn't slam. And you know, that's what happened. The cable came loose. Um, there's just a screw that pinches on the cable that attached to the door. That came loose and um, made the noise. So I fixed it, went back up on the bridge, and actually the captain was in the process of pushing the throttles forward to get back up on a plane and run again. I looked forward. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. Hmm. It was a big mountain in front of us, but we dropped, we went off of it, and it was like a hole. Ooh. And um, this 56-foot boat basically free fell into it, and it's, it was a good thing that we were going slow. If we'd have been in our full cruise, which was close to 30 knots, um, I couldn't imagine how that impact would have been when we hit the bottom of the way. Oh, and, oh my um, goodness. So, you know, one of the things, even in the deposition, that they've asked how big of the is, was the wave, and it, it's hard for me to describe that. I just know that as I was free falling forward, because um, I was standing next to where the steering wheel is at the helm, uh, I free fell forward towards the front of the, the bridge or the, the upper deck where you where you operate sport fish boats from. As I free fell forward, everything within my peripheral was in the in the hole and in, in that wave. 
And then when she hit the bottom, I just heard this terrible. <gasps> wow. And as I was ducking down, um, I just saw a crack running, starting from the, the right side or starboard side of the boat, running across the bow deck, going to the port side. And that's where the bow deck was just basically peeling off. So a good way to describe yeah. is uh, structurally, you know, there's like walls that they're through to help hold it out. And then you have your bow deck, which is almost like a, think of a Tupperware container. And you put the top on the Tupperware container. It's kind of hard to push it in because it gives it mm -hmm. some stability, some structure. You take the top off, it's easy to squeeze it. Um, right. So that's part of how this boat was breaking apart, um, where it ripped the bow deck off. And um, at that moment, you know, I, even though I saw what I saw, I was still, I guess, out of habit, expecting to feel her rise back up. But she just sure. stopped and started sinking immediately. And I turned around. Oh, my uh, goodness. To Cat Merrick and said, hey, I was like, she's going down. And mm -hmm. when I did that, he did exactly what a captain's supposed to do. Is he? I saw him turn, and he reached down, and then he stopped. So to his left were our VHF radios, and they were already dead. And that's what we would have transmitted our mayday, mayday, mayday. So here you are. The boat has is cracking in half, and you realize you have no communication. And from what I understand, you also had no tracking device uh, for anyone to find you uh, and uh, no flotation devices as well. Is that correct? So the uh, the tracking device, we call that an EPIRB. It's an emergency positioning radio beacon. The EPIRB and the life rack were just inside the salon door. So uh, my initial orders that were given were get the life jackets because you know, typically a captain, he's going to be communicating with Coast Guard or whoever they, you know, will, will reply to the Mayday on Channel 16. Our radios were dead, so he would he went to the next option was the e perb and life raft. So he dropped down to, to the mm. lower deck, and I went over to where the life jackets were, and where the life jackets were mm. underneath a seat and a compartment, and we had we had a tent in there and other things, and I could not get the life jackets oh. out. They were they were pinned down um, because you know everything I see. shifted and. Okay. As I guess I was probably there close to, I don't know, maybe 20 seconds or 30 seconds I tried. And then I looked and I started seeing that the, the bridge was about to go under. So the boat was resting bow down and then it was leaning towards the port side or to the left side a little bit. And uh, that's where the side of the boat I was on. So after it, when I couldn't get them out and I saw the bridge was about to go under, I knew I had to get off of it. So when I stepped, I basically yeah. stepped from the top of the bridge into the water, maybe three feet, something like that. Hmm. And I, then I swam around. Okay. And to see what, what Eric had going on. He was desperately punching the glass in the doors with his hands to try to break the glass. Because when the boat hmm. buckled, it took the doors and it wedged them closed so they couldn't be open. Because um, the structural issue was hmm. all twisted and that locked it yeah. together. So I imagine you guys were out there for hours in the water. Uh, miraculously, uh, in the next couple of minutes, help us understand how something popped up, you know, to the surface and how God was sparing you and preserving you in the midst of all this. Uh, what And what was going through your mind? So this is when, so it was wonderful because it's like the miracle started happening right away. Mm. So as I was around the side of the boat, I felt something pulling down on my shoulder. And as I pulled it, I looked up. And so these boats, they have these long poles with all these spreaders on them called outriggers that spread out. That's how we pull our, our baits. And then you have the tuna power. So I look up and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of stuff that can snag us and pull us down when this boat can go. So it was like, Eric, we got to get away from this thing. So the boat was leaning to the left. So you figure it'd be easiest to just kind of go to the left. But for some reason... We both cleared straight back off the back of the boat or the stern of the boat. The moment we cleared, she rolled over. If we had been there a split second longer than we were, she'd rolled over on top of us. And when she rolled over, she went straight down. So in those light winds, I was amazed because, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Perfect Storm, you see how they're loading all this stuff to the deck. Yeah. With trip. That's how it was for us. We had coolers. We had big round balls. We called poly balls on deck. The wind caught them and was mm -hmm. took them away. I mean, twelve knots is not as calm. It's not a lot of wind, but we can't swim that fast. 
And right. this was probably one of the coolest miracles that initially was the cooler popped up. A little, it was a small little bait cooler, any, any bitty thing. And we each grabbed a handle. <laughs> now, we had never talked about our bait before. Never. Right. And then we didn't, it was so cool because we didn't say that let's do this. We just did it simultaneously. We both grabbed the handle, grabbed each other, and instantly our father was our head. How would be that in peace? That team wow. That's what we've done on purpose. And we completed the Lord's Prayer. We just said it over and over and over again. We knew mm. at that moment God was our only salvation. Wow. Amazing. And how he, how the Lord preserved you and you wouldn't have considered yourself really a believer at that time uh, is what's so encouraging. It's God's love for us and his mercy that reached in to this terrible situation and kept you. So were there any memories of, you know, any introduction to the Lord, any other reasons to cry out? I mean, I know that you also uh, at one certain point, you were afraid of a shark attack and you were concerned about, um, you know, if, if there's no hope, I would rather die peacefully. Take us there. Uh, we have about a minute left right now. Take us right there to that moment. Okay. Initially, I mean, I, I started going to church as a young boy and accepted Christ at a young age, but I wasn't living the life, living a rock star lifetime at that time. So. Mm -hmm. As we get into this day and things are going on, we had a surfboard that came up. It was broken in the bag, so it really wasn't. We need you can you can live out there a long time once you're, if your body's out of the water. Our bodies were submerged, so our cores were dropping fast. Yeah. Um, Nine seven was the strongest El Nino in recorded history, and that a storm came upon us while we were out there. That developed as a result of that. Wow. And it got bad. Um, so basically if you've, anybody's been to the beach, you'll see sometimes bubbles or trash or whatever forms a line that because the ocean is like a puzzle and, and all these pieces of water are pushed together and the Ninga broke up and formed a line down sea and diagonal sea. And that was the most likely location we would find our EPIRB because we knew our like anyone. So I had searched that earlier the day before the storm got on us. Then we got to the point where it was like, we're going to die out here if we don't get that EPIRB. And mm -hmm. This was tough because when I left Eric this last time to go look for the EPIRB, it was probably a good, you know, six foot seas, which, you know, when you're head level in it, that's, that's a pretty big wave. And I knew when I left that I was never going to see him again because the clouds moved in. So there was no sense of direction. The swell, main swell direction was not the same as the wind direction. So you had a swell direction going one way. And then perpendicularly, you had the wind, so it made it like a wash machine. Okay, Johnny, I want you to hold that thought. We're going to take a little okay. break. When we come back, you're going to share the rest of this. They say you have not because you ask not. And in four years, we have never asked for a donation or any yeah. kind of support. And now we are. It's our heart to see that media is done right and that we give God glory for everything. And we just are following the call and we're doing it honest. And uh, we hope that you will catch the vision and ride this wave with us and know Amen. that it, God is going to continue to pour more and more out as we follow in obedience to Him. Amen. Go to Brenda's website. There's all kinds of resources there for giving. God bless you. BrendaCrouch.com. We're back with Johnny Savage talking about that harrowing day on the sea. So Johnny, you uh, have just left your captain. What were your last words to him as, as you left that, that scene? They were very difficult words. Um, because I did know that I would probably never see him again. So it was, uh, when, if I found that deep herb, I knew that if I found the life raft, there was no way I was gonna be able to get back to work in you know, those terrible mm -hmm. situations, um, unless it was close. My last words to him were, Eric, when I find the EPIRB, when I activate it, we aren't going to stop looking until we find it. Because mm -hmm. they would come in wherever I was. And mm -hmm. we, would, we would, obviously, we were drifting and we would have been far apart. So mm -hmm. from that moment, I traveled um, looking for the EPIRB. Um, 
there. And one of the things in the book, I try to bring the reader into the thoughts of what it was like being in the water. And those thoughts yeah. were yeah. deteriorating and deteriorating mm -hmm. point of the total loss of hope. Hypothermia was setting in. When I left Eric, he couldn't feel really anything below, you know, from his, the legs down, um, he was to that point. And once I was, when I was starting to get to that point where I started to shiver a little bit, I was like, I realized what was happening. I knew I would never find him again. And I had, I allowed my mind to rationalize that death by drowning would be better than getting ripped apart by sharks. Because we knew we were, when we, you know, in the Gulf Stream around the Straits of Florida, the whole shark would probably there to pieces. And I made the decision that I was going to end my life. I didn't want to. It wasn't. I wanted to keep on living, but I knew I wasn't going to live. And um, mm -hmm. it was, but at this point in time, of course, the seeds had steadily increased, and it was it was pretty bad. And mm. um, I made I'm, my peace. Eventually, we did find some life jackets. I put my life jacket off, and I was in the process of going under to end it. Um, I was doing a lot of dot free diving time, so I knew how far down I had to go before I couldn't get back to the surface. And finish. I figured when I got down to that point, I was going to get blow out all the air in my lungs, force myself to even further. I knew I was doing that. But in that process yeah. of doing it, it was the most amazing thing that, that's ever happened to me. And it, I didn't understand it for a long time. I mean, I knew it was of God, but as I was rolling off, all of a sudden my whole body filled with, filled with strength and um, and warmth, and I knew it wasn't mm. me and when I so it stopped me, it startled me as I was going under. And so I kind of scrambled it straight back on, you know, you know, what buoyancy the surfboard did have. And, uh, and then I heard it, it was, and I never, never forget. It was over there. It was behind my, my right shoulder. And it was, John, you heard a voice. You spend a lot of time out here, pick your line and pallet. And what was crazy is that I mean, a, a, a rough ocean is just an overcoming roar. Um, it, the sound can't penetrate, but yet that calm voice right. penetrated that roar at the sea. You know, it was almost like, I mean, even the palm of soul almost needs to be still. Jesus was in the boat. And in that moment, I was filled with hope. And mm. now I was going to commit suicide. And yeah. One of the things that uh, relate to suicide that kind of made come I've come aware of recently in the discussion I had with a yeah, friend of mine, and that was this. Think about Jesus. Jesus was in the desert. He was fully God, but he was fully man, and he was hungry. He hadn't eaten in a long time. And what does the devil do? He mm -hmm. pops up and says, turn that rock into bread. Mm -hmm. the answers of the scripture. Then what does the devil do? Down, takes him to the temple, right? He's off of the temple. What does he tell Jesus to do? Let's Jesus to mm -hmm. jump. Wow. And in that moment, I thought, you know what? If the devil is bold enough to tell Jesus to commit suicide, do you think you can try to get mm -hmm. us to do it? But mm -hmm. ultimately, what is Jesus? Mm -hmm. He always answers the scripture. And then finally, yeah. power, get out of here, Satan. And of course, we can do the same thing, but just in Jesus' mm -hmm. name. And um, I just that was just such an amazing revolution. And actually, that was yeah. after I wrote the book. I wish I would have kind of been able to put that in the book. Maybe my publisher let me do something with that. Yeah. Well, it's true. And he is a, a, a ministering uh, voice to us right in the moment that we need it. He's as instant as the mention of his name and the thought of how he saved you and kept you from what you were about to do with that audible voice that you heard. I think that this really also speaks to um, where many people are just in their lives and, and, and suddenly there's a rogue wave that you just didn't expect and, and your life is, is taken on, uh, you know, unexpected circumstances where danger and challenge and uh, overwhelming uh, emotional anxiety is eating you up inside. And, you know, some people come to that point where they think 
they're so fearful that they would just rather end it all. And I really believe that your book is going to speak to so many people right now. Also, I wanna talk about your book because you said that you also are able to target some of the needs of military and police officers dealing with some of the issues of trauma and PTSD. Your book is called Lost in the Stream. Uh, Tell us about the journey of writing the book and dealing with some of your own trauma. And has this been something that the Lord has used even to minister back to you um, some level of healing? Uh, I know that you're back out in the water and now you're not a first mate, you're a captain now, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So uh, take us on the journey of just telling your story and how you know God put that on your heart and uh, tell us about the book. So, uh, one of the things that, that I was taught young, well, as a young mate before we had all these the fancy electronics we have now is, it, well, if you're staring at your compass the whole time, you know, you aren't watching what's mm-hmm. in front of you. You might hit something. So, what we would do is we watch mm-hmm. the pattern of the waves, and then we would kind of mm-hmm. find a pattern, and then that was our line, and we'd steer that line. Wow. <laughs> and so... That was a rough sea state. I couldn't, I, I know my abilities. I know that I couldn't have found the line, but somehow I was able to find a line. I paddled right back to Eric and I was out a good way. So Johnny, you heard a voice, an audible voice, and then tell us how God sent a rescue team for both of you. So the rescue was a, a total accident. There was a boat that left Key West on in route. No, we didn't even know they were coming. A call went out from Cancun to Key West just before they had pulled out of the, or just right after they pulled out of, the, out of the slip, they said, don't send any boats, it's getting bad. So they missed that, mm-hmm. that window and they were out there. And once they were in the, in the Gulf, in the Gulf Stream, actually heading towards Key West, they were like, man, this is bad. So that they turned and ran to Cuba. So they went off course to get mm-hmm. to run, to get to the coast of Cuba, to run along the coast where they'd be out of the Gulf Stream current. Wow. And so we drifted across the Gulf Stream into the wind to be placed in the path, directly in the path of that boat. Um, I'm I guess about 19 miles. Wow, amazing. So that's where, you know, somebody doesn't believe what I said about the the voice, that's the science. Yeah. That's the current yeah. every day. And you can, everybody knows where the Gulf Stream goes, goes to the east. Well, well, clearly God ordered every step of the way and brought you out of it. This actually, that speaks to what I just mentioned. Sometimes the Lord says to us, pick your line. And he wants us to cast our eyes on him because he is our line, our lifeline. He is our hope. So tell us about it uh, in the next few minutes that we have, uh, how you've taken this story and you've been able to minister hope to those who have been through tremendous trauma and challenge and just really have lost hope. Tell us how Lost in the Stream can minister to any of us today. And that's the the nature of it, has hope. Because in that moment, you know, everything in front of me said, you're going to die. But by faith, Mm -hmm. I knew I was going to live. And Mm -hmm. that's what I try to tell people. Look, just have faith in the Lord. You know, trust him, listen. Mm -hmm. If you're on, if you don't know what's going on, just ask him, help me. Look, I need some help here. You need to show me you're with me. Because he did that the whole time. Wow. So... I didn't talk about the story for years. Um, it took, and I, you know, didn't really change a whole lot of my lifestyle. I changed it some, but I'm just still, you know, partying a lot. And and then uh, I found myself in the middle of divorce, my greatest fear. Mm. And wow, the loss of my family crushed me enough to open up. Of course, you know, since then I've got a wonderful wife now. I got you know, four kids, mm. awesome, but. It was in that moment when that happened that God was like, it's time to tell my story. And I'm like, I'm not going to glorify myself. He said, you aren't glorifying you, you glorify me. Like, okay. Mm. So that's when I started sharing it. And then I noticed a cool story that basically changed the industry worldwide now had a purpose. And he had placed Mm -hmm. that purpose in it. And now he was using that story Mm. to bring people to him. And it was it's been awesome to be along for the ride. Oh, um, and, oh, amen. And looking back, I see how he has designed my whole life around. So as a kid, my next door yeah. neighbor was a lieutenant commander of one of the SEAL teams. 
So as a kid, I used to have to go to all these demonstrations because his son and I were best friends with the SEALs. And, um, and that's been, you know, I'll address some of, you know, some of the stuff they deal with in the book. Um, you know, there's, there's a warriors that see some people stuff and, you know, just like our police officer sees some, a lot of evil stuff, evil is out mm. there, but you know what? It's already, it's already squashed. Jesus already stepped. Yeah. Away, he said. Amen. So, and so Amen. That message out that look, you know, yes. Turn to Jesus. Another message I, mm. I would like to get out to the book. is this, it's that, you know what? These people, I mean, I'm a safety guy is one is what my main career is, right? Now. Yeah. And. You know, when people get hurt, we fix them. You know, police mm. and military, they get hurt. Um, the the, the yeah. things that they have to see don't leave. And they did it for us. Mm. They did it for our freedom. They did it for our safety. They did it for mm. the book. Oh, actually opens up with a prayer that's in the wall uh, on the on a wall in the Seal Air Center. And it's, you know, we've been this nation's been blessed by God. There's no doubt. Yeah. And mm, amen. we need to take care of those people that have taken care of us. Yes, yes, we do. Well, Johnny, it's an amazing story. I sure do appreciate you, my friend. And uh, I wish we had more time to talk about some of the intricate things that I just see so much of God in your story. And he is certainly glorified by your life. And, uh, but tell us how we can find the book and how people can, how our viewers can find you as well. Okay, so here's the book. This is Lost in the Stream, and I mean, just, I, mean, I could go on it, but they're about, just about the cover. Um, so I think the cover does a good job of explaining the story. It's calling, and it was just nasty, and you know, there's the cross right in the middle. Uh, Love it. Can, it's on Amazon, and it's actually, so on Amazon, it, for a new release, it was number one new release for um, boating, ships, coping with suicide degree, and survival, mm. and it was also a number one bestseller for boating. So that's, it was an honor to get those tags. I also have a website. It's um, www.lostinthestreambook.com. Facebook, author Johnny Savage. And I'm on Instagram as well as Johnny Savage. Um, so it's been it's been a fun journey. And it's been cool to, to watch what God has done. Um, and that's one of the things they oh. back of the book. Is Amen. How he, how, Amen. How he made this happen. Yes, he did. Well, thank you so much, friend. And we appreciate you being on Inside Voice today. And to you, friends, we thank you for joining us as well. And I know that this story is an encouraging one for you, because if you feel lost in the stream, Jesus is right there as your rescuer, as your deliverer. And he wants to bring real life in the midst of your storm. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brenda Crouch.